So my name is Shafali Milcharik Desai, and I teach at the law school. I direct the Workers' Rights Clinic, the Immigrant Workers' Rights Clinic, and I also teach the undergraduate law, immigration law and policy class. And a fun fact about me is that I am an avid hiker. I love to hike, which is one of the reasons I adore Tucson. And uh, pretty much I'd rather be in the mountains than anywhere else. I did not know what women's studies was when I went to college. I really didn't even know what the word feminism was. And I was in a class my first year as a freshman in college, and we had read Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior. And that book spoke to me on many levels because Maxine Hong Kingston was not just a woman, but she was also a daughter of immigrants. I was a daughter of immigrants, and a lot of my formative thoughts around feminism came out of what I had viewed both as a woman within my culture and watching my mother. Um, it, we talked earlier about migrant women's labor. I, I, didn't, I wouldn't have known to call it that, but I certainly saw my mother engaged in all of that. And then also my experiences as a woman of color uh, from outside of my culture and the intersections of race and gender. So when I read Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior, I had this immediate affinity and recognition, uh, kind of like looking in a mirror. And when we had a class discussion about the book, the professor, I remember, asked, how many of you consider yourselves feminists? And I raised my hand right away. It didn't even occur to me not to raise my hand. I thought, yes, definitely I'm a feminist. And I, I think what I meant by that, because again, I didn't really understand what the term feminism was, but I think what I thought it was, was somebody who thinks about things through the lens of gender and race and from a place of otherness, which I very much felt all the time I was growing up in Phoenix as a child of immigrants. And there was only one other woman in the class who raised her hand when that question was asked. And so after class, she came up to me and she was a non-traditional student. She was in her 40s at the time. I was barely 20. And she had lived through the 60s and the 70s feminist movement. And we became great friends. And she taught me and uh, told me really about the history of that period, which I had no clue about because my parents were not, you know, they were immigrants. So they weren't in this country at that time doing that, that work. And um, she and I eventually decided to ask our college to create a women's studies minor. And we experienced quite a bit of resistance to that at the time. This was the early 1990s. There were not very many women's studies programs uh, all across the country. And we, we agitated and we met with deans and we met with professors and we talked intellectually and intelligently about why this was something that was needed and important to do. So that's, that's how my journey began and then um, I ended up choosing to come to law school because the University of Arizona said you can, you can create a joint degree with um, law and a master's in women's studies, which is what I did when I got here. So I very much came to law school uh, and wanted to create the joint degree program because of social justice work. And specifically in 1996, that was the year that I was, my last year in college, uh, there was a groundbreaking legal case and it was called Inri Kasinga. And it was a young, it was about a young woman from Togo, an African country, who was fleeing female genital cutting. She, her tribe and her group in Togo practiced this. This was something normal that everyone went through. And this particular woman decided she didn't want to go through it and really viewed it as a, a form of bodily harm and persecution. So she came to the United States and she made a claim for asylum and said that I, I should be provided asylum because I, I have this persecution that I'll be subjected to if I have to to go back home. And I remember reading this case in 1996 and, and thinking, this is really interesting. This is a woman, uh, a woman of color, and, and she's saying that she doesn't like the way she's being treated within her culture, and that's the basis for this legal claim. And she lost at the trial court level. The immigration judge said this isn't persecution because gender had never been a basis for persecution before in terms of asylum law. And then she appealed her case to the Board of Immigration Appeals and they reversed and they said, you know, we are going to, in certain limited circumstances, view gender-based persecution as making somebody eligible for asylum in this country. So I read that case and I thought, wow, I could maybe become a lawyer and do this kind of work and help real women on the ground to have their voices heard, which is what I think really happened in the Kasinga case. Women were finally empowered uh, in, within the asylum system to say, hey, this is something that's happening to me in my culture. I might love lots of things about my culture, but I don't like this, and this is persecution. 
So that's why I came to law school. And one of the ways that um, women's studies solidified this notion for me uh, that th it, what women's studies did is it solidified the idea that theory and activism really go hand in hand. And, and that's what I learned through my women's studies courses. That, that sure, you could talk about all of this heady theoretical stuff, but there, if there wasn't an on the ground application, then there was no there there, so to speak. And, and then law school very much complemented that because law is all about practice and, and putting what you're learning into a practice. I work very much in the realms of immigration law and policy. And right now, you can't turn anywhere without seeing something about immigration or about asylum, about our borders. I believe it's the issue of our times. And so um, it's in, in some ways really exciting to be thinking about these ideas right now because everybody is thinking about them versus 20 years ago when I first came to law school, people weren't talking about immigration, people weren't talking about asylum, and they certainly weren't talking about the intersections of race and labor and the economy and gender and sexuality with respect to this notion of immigration. And at the end of the day, immigration is really about who are we? How do we define us? Who gets to become a part of that us? Who do we want to keep out of that formulation of who we are? And and for that reason, it's something that really everyone ought to be concerned with. So one thing I didn't get to mention earlier when you said, how, how has women's studies kind of continued to allow me to uh, be an activist? Well, one of the ways that I've continued to do that, and it's very much informed from my um, the theory and practice, praxis of feminism that I learned while I was in the graduate program, um, is that I've continued to work on asylum cases, and specifically gender-based asylum cases. And it's a very difficult kind of field to be in for lots of reasons. One of them is the, some of the theoretical underpinnings behind gender-based asylum have often been these assumptions that whatever the culture is that the woman is being persecuted in, that that entire culture is bad, that there's something wrong with the culture. And as somebody who comes from a culture where I have seen women treated in ways that I don't agree with and I don't think are fair, I, I still am always cautious about labeling an entire culture or an entire tradition or entire practice as problematic because because that that's not helpful. I don't think it's and I don't think it's helpful to the women in that culture either. So what I have tried to the way I've tried to think about these issues is to empower women within whatever cultural setting or cultural group that they're in so that they can disrupt their culture's dominant paradigm. Because all cultures have dominant paradigms, but all cultures also have other paradigms. And often that's where women, those are the places women inhabit. So that's one thing that's a theoretical challenge, I think, with asylum. Th then there's like a real on the ground challenge. Uh, so what happens in this country when a woman comes um, across the border and says, I'm here because I'm fleeing persecution and I want to claim asylum. Often she's driven out to the middle of nowhere to Eloy, Arizona, which is really the middle of nowhere. It's about an hour from Tucson and an hour from Phoenix. And she's then placed in the Eloy detention facility, which is a nice way of saying maximum security prison, which is where all asylum seekers are kept until they're able to go through their cases. So as an attorney, if I want to represent one of these women and help them to, to have their voice heard through their asylum claim, then I have to drive out to Eloy. I have to go through the security apparatus of the maximum security prison out there, which is very intimidating. I mean, the moment you walk through the building, it's it's like this shroud has overcome the world. And you have to leave all of your, their lockers, you have to leave all of your electronic devices, you have to walk through um, a security you know, scanner. And then you get to, meet with your client in these tiny rooms where everyone can see what you're doing and you're meeting with her to ask her about some of the most personal things that she's ever gone through. Most of these women who are claiming asylum have been through horrific things 
and here you are, you're a stranger. She doesn't know you. She doesn't know why you want to help her. She probably hasn't told this story to anyone else because it's so deeply shameful for her, especially in the cases where there's been sexual violence. And you have to ask her really um, probing and sensitive questions because in order to make a claim for, to help somebody make a claim for asylum, you have to get their story down on paper. So I've done this and what it looks like is you go back, every week and you sit in that tiny room for three or four hours. And I remember one of these cases that I worked on, I came back home and I thought, okay, I've got a little bit of time left and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do some work and I'm gonna write down some impressions I had. And I ended up not, not being able to do anything. I just sat catatonic in my office, staring out the window because the, in, the, the story that this woman had told me about the persecution she had endured was so horrific that I, I, I couldn't even process it. Um, and, and that's called secondary trauma, which is one of the risks of, of doing this work. So it's, it, it's incredibly challenging to do it, but it's also incredibly rewarding. So this particular client said to me one day, we had been meeting for several weeks, and she said, why are you doing this? Why are you helping me? And I said, because you deserve someone to help you, because you're worth it, because you're worthy, because you matter. And she had been through awful things and she had not shed a single tear. And it was only when I said that to her, it was the only time I made her cry because I, I said to her that she had value, inherent value, just by virtue of being. It's incredibly important and it's incredibly salient in our contemporary world. One of the things I love so much about women's studies, and it was really the, one of the first um, departments to do this, I think, is that it is inherently interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So you can't really talk about anything in women's studies without also simultaneously talking about history, politics, law, sociology, gender, sexuality, science in some cases. And that's how our world operates. I think women's studies was one of the first uh, kind of theoretical bodies of knowledge that said, hey, you know, being in our own individual little departments and individual little boxes doesn't make sense for analyzing how the world works. We really have to draw from a range of theoretical perspectives. So that's one thing that makes feminist theory and praxis so necessary in today's world. But there's the other, this other thing that women's studies does that I really love and um, I have been doing in my own life for many years since, since having that education. And that is that it, it turns it, the lens back on itself. So there is no meta theory in feminism. You're always taking a look at what you've already said and deconstructing it to find more truths or, or this concept of lots of small truths instead of one monolithic truth. And a good example of this is the word feminism itself. So I learned through my women's studies education that there is no such thing as a monolithic singular feminism. There are lots of different kinds of feminisms and some of them are at odds with each other, but that that's okay. It's okay to have conflict as long as we have an awareness about it and as long as we are willing to engage in a conversation around that nuance. And if you look around at the world today, if, if we can't look at the problems in front of us with a sense of nuance and complexity, then we are not gonna get anywhere in solving them. I am so grateful for my feminist and women's studies education and, and I'm grateful for all of the professors I've had throughout my career both as an undergraduate and as a graduate student who encouraged me and pushed me to think in this way and when I say that I mean it's, it's a really out of the box kind of way of thinking. So women's studies is the reason why I thought I could go to law school and do a degree in women's studies. And women's studies is also what has continued to inform my desire to always look at things kind of with a broader notion of, of knowledge so that I'm not stuck in whatever box that I'm in. So I, I guess the parting words are go take a women's studies class, be in the women's studies department because you really can't, it's a win-win situation, you can't lose. Thank you very much.